Welcome to President's Chapel this week at Gateway Seminary. This will be the final President's Chapel of this semester as we move into our normal summer break experience. Now I may from time to time this summer come back with a special chapel message, but this will end our weekly President's Chapels, at least for this semester. Please find your Bibles and turn with me to Philippians chapter 3, where in just a moment I'm going to read a passage of Scripture that will be the foundation for today's message. Now because we work in a theological environment, most of us have heard the word sanctification and may even know what it means. The word sanctification most literally means to make holy. And it's the theological term for what we often describe as Christian growth or Christian maturity. Now, most of the time, the words sanctification or Christian growth or holiness are portrayed in a negative sense. In other words, people are said uh, to be holier than thou, are called a holy roller, and these are negative connotations. But really in scripture, the concept of sanctification, of being made more holy, of Christian growth and maturity is always presented in a more positive light. It may also be surprising to you today that in the context of a theological seminary that by the nature of, it, of the entity attracts mature Christians as leaders and maturing Christians as students, it may surprise you that I would choose to speak on sanctification or Christian growth in this context. But here's the reality. No one of us is a mature Christian. Every one of us instead hopes to be a maturing Christian. And so no matter how long you've been following the Lord, no matter how deep the depth of your devotion, no matter how much knowledge you've gained over the years about Him and your relationship with Him, every single one of us needs to continue to be growing in our relationship with Jesus Christ and changing along the way to become more like Him. So today, in the context of our seminary community, where we are maturing Christians, but not yet mature Christians. And in this context where holiness in our culture is sometimes perceived in a negative light, let's talk about what it means to be sanctified, to grow in our relationship with Jesus Christ and to be continually maturing and developing in that relationship. Paul described his experience of sanctification in Philippians chapter three, and we break into his thoughts starting in verse 10. Paul wrote, my goal is to know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death, assuming that I will somehow reach the resurrection from among the dead. Not that I have already reached the goal or I am already perfect, but I make every effort to take hold of it because I also have been taken hold of by Christ Jesus. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, Forgetting what is behind and reaching forward to what is ahead, I pursue as my goal the prize promised by God's heavenly call in Christ Jesus. Therefore, let all of us who are mature think this way. And if you think differently about anything, God will reveal this to you. In any case, we should live up to whatever truth we have attained. This passage of scripture starts by teaching us that the goal of Christian growth or the goal of sanctification is relational transformation. Look with me again into the text. Paul wanted to experience, to know, to be intimately related to Jesus Christ. Verse 10, Paul wanted to know Christ and, next phrase, the power of his resurrection. Next phrase, the fellowship of his sufferings, next phrase, being conformed to his death, and then next verse, that I will somehow reach the resurrection from among the dead. Paul describes his sanctification, his Christian growth process, as wanting to experience more and more of the person of Jesus Christ. Notice again these progressive phrases. I want to know him. I want to know the power of his resurrection. I want to know the fellowship of his sufferings. I want to be conformed to his death. And finally, I want to reach the resurrection. Of course, a plot refer referring to or in the context of Jesus' resurrection, I want to reach the resurrection from among the dead. Paul wanted to know Christ 
He wanted to know the power of his resurrection. He wanted to have fellowship with his sufferings. He wanted to be conformed to his death. He wanted to share in his resurrection. Paul's understanding of sanctification, of Christian growth, was relational transformation. It was experiencing the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ and coming to emulate that in who he was as a man. The same thing could be said for all of us. Our goal in Christian sanctification or in Christian growth or in Christian maturity is to be relationally transformed by our connection with and our uh, intimacy with Jesus Christ. Let me say it this way. Your goal in Christian growth is to get to know a person, not to accomplish a project. Let me give you a couple of illustrations. There's a difference between being married and attending a marriage seminar. Now, marriage seminars are helpful. I've both participated in them and taught them over the years. But there is a significant difference between going to a marriage seminar and completing a marriage curriculum or finishing a marriage notebook, there's a significant difference between that and actually being married. One produces relational transformation, the other one new information about what it might be like in that relationship. Here's another illustration. There's a, the, there's a difference between experiencing God and completing the Experiencing God curriculum. Discipleship, sanctification, Christian growth, maturity is more than filling in the blanks in a notebook. It's actually experiencing what the notebook is trying to guide you to, to, to experience. So Christian growth, Christian sanctification, Christian maturity is about relational transformation. It's about knowing Jesus Christ intimately and reshaping our lives to emulate who he is, what he does, how he lived, even how he died, and ultimately how he was resurrected. It's like being married, not going to a marriage seminar. It's, the, it's experiencing God, not filling in the notebook blanks in the Experiencing God curriculum. Now, practically speaking, what does this mean? Well, it means that you're experiencing Jesus and being transformed by him when you experience his power. We do this in several ways. Perhaps the most direct is through prayer. We pray and we see the transformative power of those prayers in our lives and the results of the prayers in the lives of others and we stand back in, in, and marvel at the observance of the power of God at work through us, in us, and around us in answer to prayer. We also experience Jesus' power when we attempt to do things that we cannot accomplish in our own strength. Uh, perhaps the most common one of these is sharing the gospel with another person in such a way that it's transformative in their lives and they come to place faith in Jesus. I've led a number of people to faith in Jesus over the years and every single time I've marveled at the moment, not in my glibness or in my evangelistic training or in my uh, capacity to communicate the gospel. No, I've marveled that in my stumbling attempts to communicate the gospel, somehow regeneration takes place in the life of the hearer, all by God's work, God's power. And I experience that when I share the gospel. So we are transformed and made more like Jesus when we experience this power. We also, in this passage, Paul wrote, talked about uh, sharing in sufferings and sharing in death and giving up ourselves for the good of others. So we also are transformed when we sacrifice willingly for Jesus. Sacrifice willingly. Now, during this pandemic time, we've been called upon to make various kinds of sacrifices. And some of them we've all made grudgingly and with grumbling. But frankly, most of you have made these sacrifices willingly, even joyfully as you've served your family, taken care of students, worked with your colleagues here at the seminary, or in other ways ministered in your church community. You've recognized that part of experiencing Jesus is experiencing the sacrifice he made for us, and by doing that, sacrificing to meet the needs of and care for others. Another way is dying to self and to self-interest 
Paul wrote about sharing in the death of Jesus, and we certainly cannot share in his death in the same way that his death accomplished these fantastic things for all of humanity. But nevertheless, we can share in his death in that we die to ourselves, die to self-interest, die to everything that was in it for us, and die to everything about us that doesn't serve other people. This happens in some very practical ways. Uh, as you know, for many years, I was the chaplain for the San Francisco Giants. And many people looked upon that as some kind of glamorous role and responsibility. And quite frankly, uh, there were some real privileges that came along with it, being able to be in the World Series clubhouses and, of course, get the World Series rings that uh, most of you have seen. Those were good and glamorous moments, but that's not what really happened most of the time in baseball chapel. Here's a couple of other stories that illustrate more what it was like. Uh, one day I was in spring training and a Giants executive said uh, to another person that he was in a bind on child care. His wife wasn't back from events. He had to get on to some other meetings and he had uh, uh, two preschool children. Now I knew those children pretty well from having been around their family quite a bit. And so I said, well, I think I could help you with that. He said, you, you're kidding, right? I said, no, I, I could help you with that. And so he said, man, you have no idea what that would mean for me. And so that afternoon, I became a preschool child care provider. And for a couple of hours, made sure that this family had what they needed to keep doing their jobs and keep their functions. And in my role as chaplain, I found myself caring for preschool children. Another day, I was in the ballpark also during spring training, when a Giants executive said to me, uh, hey, listen, I've got to go to a game out in uh, Surprise, Arizona, about a 30, 45 minute drive. He said, could you drive me? I said, uh, sure, I, I guess I could do that. He said, we need to pick up another person along the way. It was Felipe Alou, who was uh, the recently retired manager, now a consultant for the Giants. I said, okay, sure. So I got in the car and I drove this executive and I picked up this Felipe Lou and they sat together and talked the entire time, time as if I weren't even in the car. Uh, drove them to the ballpark, uh, got them there, we got in, uh, they sat together, talked for three hours, evaluating players, doing their job, working on things. I just sort of sat there and watched a spring training game and then when it was over, drove them back. And I wondered later, was that really the best use of my afternoon? But then I was reminded, I signed on to serve the San Francisco Giants. I didn't sign up for the glory moments or the glamour moments, I signed up to serve. And if in the moment what was most needed by the leadership of the ball club was that kind of service, then that's the kind of service I needed to provide. And so I've always sort of laughed a bit when people have said, oh, it must have been awesome to be with the Giants, you know, and they think only of the glamour moments. And I think about the times I was a driver and a childcare provider and a host of other times I could tell you story after story after story where Ann and I found ourselves doing very menial things to meet the needs of people in the ball club or in the organization. And through that process, demonstrating that we were there not to get out of it something for ourselves, but we were there to sacrifice ourselves for the good of others. And in that process of sacrifice, uh, quite frankly, discovering a deep satisfaction in what it meant to really share in the life of Jesus Christ where we set aside our own interest and instead magnify the needs and interests of others. So, this first part of the message teaches us that Christian sanctification or Christian growth or maturity is really about relational transformation. It's about you getting more intimately acquainted with Jesus Christ and letting him affect you, how you live, how you think, how you act. It's sharing in who he is. It's like being married, not like going to a marriage seminar. It's like experiencing God, not just filling in the blanks in a notebook about experiencing God. It's about prayer and witnessing as evidences and examples of God's power in your life. It's about uh, die, sacrificing yourself willingly for other people around you during a time like we're living today. And it's about dying to self-interest so that you think about ministry and meeting the needs of others, not for what you can get out of it, but instead, how you can die to yourself and extend yourself and sacrifice yourself meeting the needs of others. In those contexts, we learn more and more about Jesus and allow him to shape us into the people he really wants us to be. Now, a second big idea in the text is this. The process of Christian growth is demanding. Let's look back into the text. 
In verses 12 and 13, Paul wrote that he did not consider himself a fully mature Christian. He said, not that I've already reached the goal or not that I've already taken hold, uh, not that I've already achieved or reached what I ultimately need to become, not that I've already taken hold of or not that I've already been made perfect. He said, instead, I make every effort. I, I strive, I reach forward, I pursue as my goal. When you look at the language of verses 12, 13, and 14, you see that Paul is underscoring this process of Christian growth is demanding. Uh, I haven't achieved everything I should. I haven't taken hold of everything that's been put before me. In fact, I st instead find myself striving, pressing, pushing forward, trying to get there. And so the process of Christian growth is not passive, it's active. And the process of sanctification is not painless, it can be painful. It's not relaxing, it's striving. It's trying to move forward and become more and more like Jesus Christ. So the application of this is clear. You are not yet a fully mature Christian. If Paul wasn't, you certainly aren't, and I certainly am not. We have to avoid the arrogance of thinking, well, I've arrived. I'm a seminary professor. I'm a seminary administrator. I, I have a job at a seminary where they recognize me for my spiritual success and my spiritual growth. Why, I've arrived. No, no you haven't. And if you think you have, then you have stumbled into pride and you are far from growing in Christ in that area. You also have to avoid the indifference of thinking, yeah, I, I know I haven't arrived, but I, I frankly, I, I, have, I have grown enough. I may not be all the way there yet, but I'm far enough along I can just coast from here on in. Well, that's not the language Paul uses. He says you have to keep striving. You have to keep pressing forward. You have to keep taking hold of. You have to keep pursuing. All of this active language speaks to us about resisting the temptation to think that we've arrived and resisting the temptation to think that we've grown enough and instead stay focused on moving forward in our relationship with Jesus. Your Christian growth requires continued effort. Now, I think that there's a good analogy or a good pattern for this in the growth, for example, of the human body. I have uh, multiple grandchildren, and one of the joys of watching them in their early years is seeing how rapidly they develop and grow. From just uh, birth up to age four, five, six years old. We've watched these children grow these last few years and they are growing so rapidly and changing so much. And, and that's gonna continue for each one of them up until their teen years. So let's say first 15, 17 years of a person's life, they are growing rapidly and changing significantly. But most of us hit a place late teens, early 20s where physically we, we stop growing. We stop changing. We stop getting bigger and better and stronger. In, in fact, let's, let's just be really honest. Most of us kind of peaked back then and well, physically, we've kind of been going downhill ever since. That's hard to hear, but it's really the reality. We, we grow rapidly and then we kind of settle into a long life period of either stability or even some decline. I see a similar pattern in how people grow spiritually. When people first become Christians, they grow rapidly, especially in the first few months or even the first few years. They're growing, they're changing, they're developing, they're excited. There's a great deal of energy about what they're achieving and what they're experiencing and how they're changing. But for most Christians, you sort of reach a point where you start to plateau or level out. For most of us who work here at the seminary, we reached that point a long time ago. So we can mistakenly believe that that long trajectory of relative stability is not normal or in some ways is, should, have, should have been prevented. In other words, we, we mistakenly think that we're supposed to maintain that trajectory of growth from our early Christian years all throughout our lifetime. And frankly, that's just not realistic. Just like it's not realistic for a baby or a child to keep growing like that, that up into their 60s or 70s. It just isn't going to happen. So I think a better pattern here is to understand that Paul said, you gotta keep moving forward. You gotta keep pressing forward. You gotta keep growing. But don't expect to keep growing and changing at the same rate and pace you did when you first became a Christian. But that doesn't mean you shouldn't still be growing, changing, and being shaped 
no matter how far along you go in your lifetime. You know, I've now been a Christian for almost 50 years. It's hard for me to imagine saying that, that I've been a Christian for almost 50 years. And certainly the first few years of my Christian faith were uh, slow growth years in my teen years, but then in my late teen years, in my early 20s, and even up to age 30, I had rapid and remarkable spiritual progress and growth. But over the last 30 years or so, my growth pattern has been a lot steadier. But I hope that it's continued to edge upward as I've continued to grow and learn and change and develop in my relationship with God. So what I want to challenge you to do today is to recognize that your Christian growth, your sanctification is demanding. You're supposed to keep pressing forward, keep moving forward, keep pushing ahead, keep pursuing the goal, as Paul said. But recognize that you're not going to keep growing and changing like you did when you were first a Christian. But that doesn't mean you can't keep making incremental progress as you keep moving along through life. Well, Christian growth, sanctification, is demanding. And now one final idea. And that is that the barriers limiting our Christian growth are deceptive. Paul warned the Philippians about pressuring each other to grow. Look with me in verse 15. Paul said, therefore, let all of us who are mature think this way. And if you think any differently, God will reveal this to you. In other words, let's be careful about what we think about other people. Let's think mostly about ourselves and how we're growing and not worry about judging other people. Let God take care of them and take care instead of what God has revealed to you. Paul challenged the Philippians not to tell other people what to live up to, but instead to live up to what they had already learned. Notice verse 16. In any case, we should live up to whatever truth we have attained. Look, uh, you must learn to cooperate with God who grows people at his own pace. Who grows people at his own pace. It is so easy to become judgmental and to focus our attention on the growth of others and how they are or are not progressing according to the standards that we'd like to impose on them. One of the interesting processes for me as an adult has been watching my adult children in their development in their relationship with God. There have been moments when I've looked at what they were doing or thinking or saying and wondered, why can't they, why can't they see this? How can they not know what to do? Why are they making these choices? Don't they understand this is the best way? But most of the time, I've been able to be silent, and allow God to work his processes with them and help them come to understand how they're growing and learning and being shaped and to experience their own process of sanctification at their own pace and see how God would make them the person he wants them to be. Uh, a new phrase that Ann and I have been using lately to help us remember this is this, this phrase, everyone needs their own story. You know, Ann and I have some remarkable stories of how God has shaped us over the years. And quite frankly, some of those stories are painful. They involve times when we've failed each other in our relationship, when we've been angry or judgmental or, or difficult in our marriage. Uh, they reflect on times when we were faithless or when we struggled or when we, when, we, when we made wrong decisions and had to back up and make different decisions. But through all of those experiences, we've learned, we've grown, and they've become part of our story. And now when we talk to others, we're able to reflect on our story and help people to grow by the encouragement of what they've seen us live through. As we look at our adult children, Ann and I often remind each other they have to have their own story. We, ha we can't solve all their problems. We can't advise them on every situation. We can't make their choices for them. No. They have to grow at their own pace, in their own way, so they'll have their own story of how God has brought about this process of sanctification in their lives. Paul writes, look, focus on what God has revealed to you. Don't spend so much time talking about how other people ought to be growing. Instead, focus on how you are supposed to be responding and growing in the circumstances God has brought in your life. And then, remember, 
to live up to what you already know. Verse 16 has always been so convicting to me. We should live up to whatever truth we have attained. In other words, keep your focus on living out what you already know. Now, quite frankly, this is one of the pressure points and even danger points of working in a seminary environment and of being around people who spend all, most all their time thinking about God, the gospel, and the word of God. We know a lot. And the Bible says we should be focused on living out what we've already learned. So instead of focusing on other people and what they should be doing, we should be focusing on ourselves and asking God to help us to live up to what we already know we should be doing. So today, I've tried to challenge you on this issue of sanctification. I don't want you to be holier than thou, and I don't want you to be a holy roller, but I do want you to be holy. To be sanctified means to be made holy, to be set apart for God's use, and in the context of our relationship with God through Jesus Christ, to be made more and more like Jesus Christ. Paul says, sanctification is relational transformation. It's coming to know Jesus in such an intimate way that you share in things like his death, his resurrection, his power, his sufferings. It is, in summation, to know him, as Paul put it. Relational transformation. And then, once you start on that pathway, it will be demanding, never ending, a lifetime process. Oh, you may grow rapidly at the beginning, but that doesn't mean you're not supposed to keep growing incrementally over a lifetime as you continue to experience more and more of what it means to know him. And then, keep your focus on your own spiritual growth. Don't spend a lot of time talking about how other people ought to be growing or what other people ought to be doing. Instead, ask God to help you to live up to what you know you should be doing. He has taught you many things. You have learned much from his word. You are responsible to live that out. Ask him for the strength to do that. Sanctification, it is the responsibility of every believer. It's the opportunity of every believer. And I challenge you today, Gateway Community, to take seriously this responsibility to keep growing in relational transformation with Jesus, moving in that demanding process of growth that we've been given and keeping the focus on how we're supposed to be living up to all that we have already learned. Thank you for listening to this message today. Thank you for the example you've set so often around this seminary and in our community of what it means to be a dynamic growing Christian. Keep it up as we move through this challenging summer together and as we continue to fulfill our mission of shaping leaders who expand God's kingdom all around the world.